when water burns. You pay attention. On the 22nd June 1969, Cleveland's Cuyahoga River, so loaded with oil and chemicals it behaved like lighter fluid, erupted into five-story flames, splashing Lake Erie onto front pages worldwide as Exhibit A of Environmental Collapse. Why care in 2025? That dead lake now serves 11 million people with drinking water and powers a billion-dollar walleye fishery, proof that ecosystems can reboot if we let them. We're about to trace that turnaround and what it means for the climate fights ahead. Like bold, solutions-driven stories, smash that subscribe button on Beyond Atlas Explore. At 25,000 square kilometers, Lake Erie covers about as much wet real estate as the US state of Vermont. Hardly tiny, yet the small fry of the Great Lakes Club. Its 1,300 kilometers of shoreline brushes four US states and Ontario, putting 12 million people within an easy day trip of its water. Where brooding Lake Superior dives to 400 meters, Erie's average depth is a kiddie pool 19 meters and just 7 meters in the Western Basin. Translation, it warms up fast each spring, turbocharging photosynthesis and fish growth. The flip side, pollutants have nowhere to hide. What flows in hangs around. Erie claims the biggest watershed to lake ratio of the five sisters. 58,000 square kilometers of farms, factories and suburbs spread across Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York and Ontario. Every cornfield fertilizer spill, every rust belt smokestack, every leaky sewer line eventually trickles into the same blue bucket. Water doesn't stop for selfies at Erie. It drags along the combined outflow of Lake Superior, Michigan and Huron, three industrialized giants upstream before exiting through the Niagara River. Erie is the Great Lakes sump pump. It inherits everyone else's mess first, then has to clean up before the water rushes over Niagara Falls. All that shallow, nutrient-rich water makes Erie North America's walleye factory, but it's also a perfect petri dish for algae blooms and hypoxic dead zones. Think of it as a sports car engine. High performance, zero tolerance for dirty fuel. When humans crank up the contaminants, Erie sputters, sometimes literally bursts into flame. Cleveland, Detroit, Buffalo, early 20th century powerhouses that treated Erie like one giant coolant tank. Steel mills quenched red-hot billets in lake water, then sent it back out shimmering with oil slicks and heavy metals. Paint plants and chemical works joined the party, dumping PCBs, benzene and more. Because regulations hadn't been invented yet, mid-century cities grew faster than their pipes. Combined sewers overflowed with every thunderstorm, firing raw human waste straight into tributaries. Detergents packed with phosphates added, clean suds that supercharged algae. In summer, beaches smelled like rotten eggs. In winter, ice slabs froze around toilet paper. Picturesque, right? Post W War II, agriculture went big. Synthetic fertilizer, factory dairies, endless corn. Rain washed surplus nitrogen and phosphorus off those rows and into creeks, turning them neon green by the time they hit the lake. Farmers fed the world, but also fed algal blooms the size of small countries. Algae thrive, then crash. When trillions of cells decompose, they suck oxygen from the water column, creating hypoxic, dead zones where even carp gasp a breath. By the 1960s, Erie's central basin lost its summer oxygen blanket every year. Commercial halls plummeted. Tug captains joked that nets came up smelling like matchsticks. Newspapers ran headlines like Lake Erie, Graveyard of the Great Lakes. Scientists warned that without a course correction, the basin would turn into a stagnant marsh. The 1969 Cuyahoga Inferno wasn't the first fire, just the one with the perfect timing. TV cameras rolling, a nation suddenly primed to freak out. Oil-soaked debris had flashed on the Cuyahoga a dozen times before, but June 22, 1969, hit different. TV crews filmed fireboats punching holes in a river of flame, while commuters gawked from a freeway overpass. 
the nation finally asked, how polluted must water be to burn? Time magazine splashed, the river that oozes rather than flows, across newsstands. Life, National Geographic, and the evening anchors piled on. Photographs of molten orange water licking railroad trestles made Cleveland the punchline, but they also made pollution impossible to ignore. Ten months later, 20 million Americans skipped class and work to clean parks, march downtown, and demand action. Lake Erie posters, Save Our Great Lakes, became rally icons. Environmentalism graduated from niche to mainstream in a single day. Congress, feeling the heat, birthed the Environmental Protection Agency in December 1970, then passed the Clean Water Act in 1972. For the first time, factories needed discharge permits and cities had to treat sewage before dumping it. Polluting a river stopped being free. Also in 1972, Washington and Ottawa inked the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement targeting phosphorus and toxic chemicals on both shores. The deal turned Lake Erie from forgotten backwater into a cross-border test case for large-scale restoration. First target, the algae buffet. Detergent makers stripped out phosphates, wastewater plants upgraded with activated sludge tanks and chemical precipitators. Result? Municipal phosphorus loads crashed by more than 80% in 15 years, starving the blooms under the brand new Clean Water Act. Factories suddenly needed discharge permits, plus shiny scrubbers, neutralization ponds, and closed loop cooling. PCB levels in lake trout fillets nosedived. Oil sheens stopped rainbow coating marinas. Quick favor, I'm chasing my first thousand subscribers. Tap that subscribe button if you like these restorative comeback stories. Remember those soggy borderlands bulldozed for parking lots? Agencies and non profits bought them back, broke the dikes, and let cattails reconquer the mud. Every hectare of revived marsh now filters as much nitrogen as a small treatment plant and gives ducklings and muscalunge a place to grow up. With oxygen returning to the central basin, walleye roared back like a 1990s boy band reunion. Charter boat captains who'd once quit to drive taxis relaunched businesses. Ohio's annual walleye haul now tops 40 million fillets. Bonus side effect. Tourists spending cash in lakeside towns that had written off the water. Lake Erie now pumps more than $1 billion a year into the regional economy through sport fishing alone, while newer revenue streams, kayak rentals, birding festivals, craft beer lake cruises, stack further millions. Continuous sensor buoys, satellite nitrate maps, and volunteer beach testers make sure the bad old days never sneak back unnoticed. Row crop agriculture still ring fences the watershed, and even best management practices can't catch every granule of nitrogen or phosphorus. Heavy spring rain turns farm tiles into fire hoses, flushing nutrients straight into the western basin. Perfect starter fluid for modern neon green algal blooms. On a sticky August weekend, a toxic cyanobacteria plume parked itself over Toledo's intake pipes, spiking microcystin levels past safe limits. Faucets went dry for 400,000 residents, Supermarkets sold out of bottled water in hours. Lesson learned. One bloom can still shut down a city in 2025. No match needed. Warmer, stormier summers mean longer bloom seasons. Fiercer rainfall, reed, more runoff. And better odds for invasive species like grass carp or round goby to settle in. Add shrinking ice cover in winter, and the lake's metabolic engine now redlines for more of the year. Great for algae rough on oxygen. Every fleece wash, tire abrasion and discarded straw sheds polymer confetti. Lab nets now find tens of thousands of microplastic particles per square kilometer in Erie's surface water. We don't fully know how they affect fish, let alone human drinkers, but early studies show plastics can carry hitchhiking toxins straight up the food web. Erie's comeback is proof of concept, not a permanent guarantee. Precision fertilizer apps, regenerative farming, green stormwater infrastructure, and plastic capture tech are the next tools on deck, but only if policymakers, scientists, and everyday lake lovers keep pushing as hard as the problem. Uh.
Dead Lake rebounded within one human generation, proof that reefs, peatlands and rainforests can too if we ease the pressure and let biology work. No EPA or Clean Water Act would have meant no comeback, period. Friendly press pledges don't cut it. Binding limits turn dial-spinning science into results you can measure. Sport fishing now pumps over a billion dollars a year into coastal towns, dwarfing the smokestack jobs lost to pollution controls. Clean water isn't a luxury, it's economic infrastructure. Citizen buoy networks, kayak trash hunts and TikTok bloom alerts, unthinkable in 1969, are today's early warning radar, keeping politicians on the clock. When a river caught fire, Lake Erie turned disaster into a turning point. Its revival shows we can flip eco-horror into comeback if we choose speed over apathy and science over spin. The next chapter is ours. Want more no-fluff recovery stories? Subscribe to Beyond Atlas Explore.